welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. This is a crazy week in the markets and one in which uh, we have a few different things we want to say. A little bit different approach this week um, because I'm going to be really kind of delving all into a single topic, which is these uh, trade-related issues around protective tariffs that have been announced but not implemented by the Trump administration. If you think back to a lot of these uh, video dividend cafes that we were doing, let's say, three months ago, four months ago, a lot of them did delve into single issue uh, weeks where we were focusing a lot of attention on tax reform. And it was a tremendously market impacting activity and it happened to be one that we were really supportive of, uh, even though maybe not every um, jot and tittle of the tax bill was exactly what we wanted. We really believed uh, that it was a very pro-growth um, piece of legislation. We believed it was going to get uh, uh, implemented, passed into law. In fact, it did. And we believed it would be very productive for the um, investing uh, markets and ultimately very good for growth in the broad economy. And we think that all those things have proven to be true. And in fact, with the last point, it's going to continue to be true throughout the year. So in that case, we were taking a singular issue that had a lot of relevance and we were applying it um, to investors from the vantage point of being supportive and advocates. And I think that uh, this could last uh, just for this week, could last a few weeks longer. But now we have another issue that we think is very important and a sort of single issue. And yet we're very, um, we're very negative on it. We're very concerned about what in fact is happening. And that is... Um, the proposed tariffs uh, from the Trump administration so far announced on the steel and aluminum industries. Um, so I did a uh, full article this week at Forbes.com regarding um, where I think the, a lot of the fallacy is around trade deficits. We wrote about it a little last week um, and I did a full podcast at Advice and Insights, our weekly podcast fleshing out, um, I think rather extensively, the case against protective tariffs and for a more pro-trade and ultimately pro-growth agenda. Right now, I have to speak specifically around the aspect of investor appetite, what this means to markets. Um, people would say, okay, well, the market was down over a thousand points last week, the bulk of that coming after these things were announced. Um, but this week, the markets seem to kind of putter around a little bit. As I talk on Thursday, we're up 80 points. We were down 80 points yesterday, and we were pretty much flat Monday, Tuesday. So the market hasn't moved a lot. Well, if this was really the kind of horrific event that I'm describing it as, which it is, why are markets a little more sanguine this week? Well, first of all, of course, they dropped over 1,000 points last week alone in the Dow. But there is a very key thing going on. And, and it should be understood, there is no um, uh, protective tariff that has been implemented yet. It has been announced. One day, they will say, whether it be President Trump or his trade advisor, um, Pete Navarro, will say this is not a negotiating tactic. This is what we're doing. Uh, and it's got to be sweeping and across the board, meaning not targeted applying to every country, every aspect of importing uh, steel and aluminum into the U.S. And then uh, an hour later, President Trump will tweet that we're going to have to do this unless we can get a better deal on NAFTA or something like that. And so there's a significant amount of hope in the market that the president hasn't, in fact, solidified his position. Him saying he solidified his position is completely irrelevant to markets ought to be irrelevant to anybody who's been paying attention over the last year. These things are fluid. So markets are too smart and too apolitical to price in a certainty of a negative or a certainty of a positive. Markets do not know that some aspect of protectionism is not coming and therefore they need to be rightly defensive. And markets do not know that um, the, the whole thing is not going to be... Um, much to do about nothing and that they'll back off and backpedal and and water down the whole approach so it doesn't leave room for significant bullishness or bearishness out of this particular issue 
And so you get this kind of puttering around. The resignation this week, a National Economic Council director, Gary Cohn, who's certainly the highest ranking economic official in the Trump administration, former president of Goldman Sachs, number two guy there at Goldman, had been there over 20 years, absolutely brilliant, Wall Street mind. Um, his resignation caused the market to drop over 300 points. It ended up rebounding a little near the end of the day, all again on whispers that maybe they're kind of softening and backpedaling from what they originally announced. But I think the point I want to make is that um, this thing could get very bad if indeed his, he digs in his heels, appoints new economic administration the uh, replacement to Gary Cohn, who is in fact very protectionist as uh, some of his impulses are and as uh, Pete Navarro's are. Um, and if he decides he has very little to lose politically or economically to in fact, at what he said last weekend on Twitter, I don't believe for a second he actually believes it, that, oh, a trade war is easy to win. Um, I think that the market, if it were to start pricing in those realities, would would react very negatively, either very suddenly or even perhaps just over time. The compression of growth. This is something that is very important for listeners, viewers, readers, clients to understand. Um, by definition, more trade is pro-growth. And the, the reasoning there is that trade only exists if two parties both want to do it. Two parties only want to do it if they deem it in their best interest. Wealth creation comes from a good or service being exchanged for something else, money usually being a medium of exchange for goods and services, wherein there's an optimization of what each side wants. Each party wants something different. And then in a more complex economy, you get, you get the um, implementation of this where, where people learn that they can actually gain, but they need a certain item more than another um, item and they can exchange these things in such a way that they're ending up with one plus one equaling more than two for them and the other party doing the same thing. This is all basic stuff and I could, uh, the law of comparative advantage, I can explain another time or you could Google it because it's pretty important to understand. I don't think this administration or at least the argument that is winning the day right now ideologically inside the White House believes in the law of comparative advantage, which is a three or four hundred year old law uh, of economics and understanding we've had since the days of Adam Smith, certainly into the days of David Ricardo and the great classical economist of the early 19th century. Okay, what, I get, what I'm getting at is that more trade is a good thing by definition. So to the extent that we end up in a position where there's less trade going on, because we want better terms or we want to penalize someone who's we don't like what they're doing or things like that. There could be good reasons and bad reasons, and that's sort of not my point right now. But to the extent we end up with less trade, that is anti-growth. That's not controversial. It's not a political opinion. This is basic, basic economics. The more trade you have going on, then uh, people acting in their own best interest, doing voluntary exchange of one another towards the aim of self-betterment and self-interest, um, and wealth creation, uh, the more growth you, you will have. So I do not know that that's the way this is going to go. I do not know there will be suppression of trade. I know there is threats. I know there is flexing. And I know that there is temptation to, in that direction, impulses in that direction. The replacement of the National Economic Council director to Gary Cohn is going to be a big deal in my mind. The next step in where they kind of go with this stuff on steel and aluminum. But if you read DividendCafe.com this week, I walked through exactly what leverage the European Union has as it pertains to this issue, um, what exactly a trade war looks like. And, and I think you will see that the just marginal compression of multiple on growth in our economy applied to the stock market could be very, very bearish. I, I cannot tell you that's going to happen. I can tell you it's a very legitimate risk right now that we're watching carefully and that it could take a long time to get priced in, that through time, um, the Chinese buying less soybeans kind of gets kicked into the market and America being able to export more European cards. You guys, America export European cards. 
you have such a significant amount of European cars being manufactured in America that are then getting exported. If the tariffs and so forth back and forth end up uh, affecting that, you have a big impact. And then just all kinds of collateral damage that could go on if Canada gets in the mix, if it affects our NAFTA talks with Mexico and Canada, and not to mention the European Union, who's already talked about uh, putting tariffs on the orange juice that we export to them out of Florida, Harley Davidson out of Wisconsin, bourbon out of Kentucky. Those are real life examples they've used. A lot of apparel, clothing that we export. So yes, um, I would encourage you to listen to Advice and Insights podcast that we did this week on trade for a much more elaborate and maybe a little bit higher end. There's some more difficult economic concepts I unpack around trade deficits. But right now, those of you that listen to this just as a little 10 minute blurb on um, uh, on trade itself, that are wanting to understand better what it means to you with trade as an investor. My, our, my, my statement I would say to you is I can see a situation where this weakened US dollar potentially helping emerging markets, but not all, potentially helping Japan, depending on where they get involved uh, as an exporter. They mostly export higher end goods. And then um, potentially being a real challenge for a lot of US stocks. So we have to watch this very carefully. It's the first time in a long time that I believe there was the potential of a totally unforced policy mistake suppressing P.E. ratio in the in the broad stock market. I would absolutely not be an index investor at this time in U.S. stocks. You, uh, you would want to be very active depending on where a lot of these things shake out, and that's what we intend to be. I'm going to leave it there. I went on longer than I intended. It's definitely a week where you want to read DividendCafe.com and you want to listen to the Advice and Insights podcast. Thank you for listening, and uh, we'll see if there's some different news to share with you next week.